Hello. Those lights are really bright. <laughs> All right, I'm going to talk about taking Bitstream seriously. Uh, so, uh, arguably, there are two main acquisition paths that we tend to deal with with collecting institutions, repositories that deal with uh, materials. And I'm I'm using the word archive here in the OAS sense of anybody who's responsible for the collections in the repository. So basically, we have a very systematic transfer, where basically we have close coordination between the producer and the archive. Uh, we have at least some say in how the materials are produced and packaged and transferred. Uh, there's relatively little need to do a lot of ad hoc sort of response to the materials that end up coming in. Then there's the dealing with whatever we get, which is little pre-coordination, the archive has relatively little say in how materials are produced, packaged, and transferred, and there's a lot of need to do all kinds of ad hoc um, follow-up and response to whatever data happen to come in. Uh, so some examples of a lot of developments in uh, systematic uh, transfer uh, protocols and tools for transfer. Many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with Bagit. We have um, things like the, um, the guide that, um, that Kevin and Elliot did on ingest, um, all kinds of systematic thought about how that process should work. Paymus, which is all about the coordination between the producer and the archive and how that handoff should happen. There's definitely been a lot of development in this space, uh, but sometimes things are a little bit messier, right? I think that the category of the dealing with whatever we get is pretty large, and a lot of what I'm gonna talk about over just the next few minutes relates to trying to be a little bit more systematic, using a little bit more software to try to deal with these messy situations where we get these kinds of media and have to deal with them. So uh, there's been a lot of thought and activity around applying digital forensics to archival work, to preservation work. Uh, so Seamus Ross and Ann Gow back in 99 did a, book, a report on what they called digital archaeology. More recently, there have been a variety of streams of activity into a lot of different collecting institutions that have been applying forensics. Um, there's the Purpose Project, uh, Bill Underwood's work at Georgia Tech. Uh, the uh, Computer Forensics and Born Digital Content in Cultural Heritage Collections, which had a symposium. Some of you were there, I know, in the report coming out of that. Um, the Ames Project, I recommend looking at that white paper if you haven't before. Uh, there's the Digital Forensics Records um, Project, which is uh, led by Luciana Durante, University of British Columbia. Um, and the Open Planets Foundation has had a couple hackathons just in the past year. One was in Copenhagen, and we hosted one in Chapel Hill that are all about trying to apply digital forensics in these environments. So the Big Curator Project is a project funded by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. Uh, we're now in year two. We'll be headed pretty soon into phase two, which will involve the same team, but also involve a community lead. So uh, Porter Wilson will serve as the community lead. Uh, it's a partnership between the School of Information and Library Science at UNC Chapel Hill and the Maryland Institute for Technology and Humanities, University of Maryland. Uh, so this is the team. That's me. There's Matt Kirschenbaum, who's the co-PI. Cam Woods is the technical lead. Alex Chasanoff is the project manager. Sunita Misra is a graduate student at UNC doing a lot of development work with Cam. And Porter Olson, who is a doctoral student at Myth, and as I mentioned, will be becoming the community lead in the coming year. Uh, we have two groups of advisors. We have a professional expert panel and a development advisory group. Uh, the professional expert panel are basically people who had already been trying to make these connections in their institutions and would um, hopefully benefit from the things that we're developing in the development advisory group, as the name implies, that people have some more experience with software development and associated tools. Uh, so the main goals are to develop and disseminate and package um, and support um, open source tools that can help people to apply digital forensics methods. Uh, and there are two main things that aren't traditionally addressed by the digital forensics field itself, which are building these things into our workflows, library workflows, archival workflows, and also supporting provision of public access to data. Because in digital forensics as a field itself, the scenario generally involves seizing evidence, using it for a particular purpose, keeping it in a controlled environment, and not disseminating the data to the public in the way that libraries and archives do. So the BitCurator environment is a bunch of different software that's bundled together. Um, uh, most of it is pre-existing open source software, but a number of the uh, tools have also been developed by our team. It can be run as a self-contained environment. Uh, it's based on Ubuntu Linux running directly on a computer, right? You install it as Linux. Um, it can run in a virtual machine in whatever operating system you want in VirtualBox, and also a lot of the different tools can be run independently if you find them useful. Um, I want to give a quick acknowledgement to Simpson Garfinkel because basically there are a lot of things I'm going to talk about that he produced that we are reusing for the project. So Firewalk, Bulk Extractor, DFXML, which is our main metadata convention, um, also the Forensics Wiki, which is a rich resource of information about various tools, and Digital Corpora, which has test data that you can use if you're trying to run tools to figure out how well they work. 
Uh, so the, the, the practices and uh, processes that are supported by the Big Creator workflow are basically acquisition, reporting, redaction, and metadata export. Um, and if you're interested in more details about that workflow, check out the website. Uh, the metadata conventions, as I mentioned, are DFXML, which is a set of metadata elements that are generated by these tools. Um, we have put together a tag library, which explains what those elements are. Uh, this is basically the process. FiWalk and Bulk Extractor uh, put their own metadata. They have to be integrated together and then packaged. Um, and if you're interested in uh, more about that, you can read the paper that we published this past year. So here's the desktop. Ooh, it looks like a Linux environment. Um, you can um, acquire disk images using Gimager, and you can see the information filled in here. Uh, you can export file system content using FiWalk. So this is new, the release that goes out today. Um, is going out today, which is 0.3, um, has a graphic user interface to tools that are otherwise just command line tools. So this is FiWalk, where basically you point it at a directory or disk image and exports all of the file system metadata and writes it to wherever you put it. Um, it shows you what the command line output is in case you want to use a GUI but still know what the command line would be telling you. Uh, the output looks like this. It's basically a whole bunch of XML about the, the file system, all the different directories and files. Uh, this is the metadata specific to a file, so they're what are called file objects, where it shows you what the file of the path are, the timestamp information, uh, permissions, the various things that are sitting in the file system. Uh, then there's Bulk Extractor, which again is a tool developed by Simpson Garfinkel at the Naval Postgraduate School, and it tries to identify what are called features, which means basically information that might be of interest because it's revealing about individuals or organizations, email addresses, social security numbers, credit card numbers, and things like that. Um, so this is uh, the Bulk Extractor viewer interface. It runs a number of different scanners that look for different kinds of information. You can turn them on or off, depending on which things you're trying to look for in the materials. Um, uh, once it generates the report, um, it writes it to a directory, and then you can um, go in and see the output. So for example, here is a histogram of all the email addresses that are poured on a disk. And if you go into any of those individual email addresses, you can then see in context where they appeared within that disk, right? Perhaps useful for doing description, perhaps useful for doing redaction, right? The next step could be running uh, the redaction script that goes in and pulls that off the disk. Uh, then there's the matching of basically the bulk extractor output and the FiWalk output. So FiWalk is aware of file systems and generates everything from the folder and the file structure. Um, bulk extractor ignores the file system and just goes based on offset within the disk, right? So it's just reading the raw data off the disk and saying, you know, 3,000 bytes in, I found an email address or something. So basically this tool says, show me the output from that tool and that tool, and then map them together to create what's called an annotated output. Um, so there are also a number of uh, bit curator reports that are specific to the software we've developed. This is that third tab on this GUI that you see there. Um, and basically outputs things like this, what, what files um, and folders um, are on the, on the drive, you know, how big is it, how many files are there. This is showing PDF output. Um, our default at this point is to presume that people will generate um, Excel because people can sort it and search over it and the software supports doing that. Um, this is the bulk extractor features, so you know, it was run and there were five instances of telephone numbers, for example. Right? Uh, these are the actual features themselves, so a report that says this was the email address, this was the telephone number, credit card number, whatever they might be. Uh, we also have Nautilus scripts, which are basically just scripts built into the operating system so that, for example, any file you look at, you can right click and generate an MD5 sum of it, or things like that, right? Just they kind of facilitate the process of things that people might want to do. So here's an example of the MD5 hashes of files that were generated by running one of these Nautilus scripts. Uh, so for further information about the project, we have two main websites. One is the wiki, which is where you can uh, see um, uh, screencasts, uh, read the documentation, download the software itself, join the, uh, the user group, which has started to get quite active recently, which is quite exciting. Um, and then there's the main website, uh, bitcreator.net, that has information about the project, the personnel, and things like that. So um, as I had mentioned, uh, version 0 0.3 is out today, and it has um, uh, some functionality that I think a lot of people will find quite useful in terms of the graphic user interface to, uh, to pull these various things out. Um, we really encourage you to try out the software. You know, if you have a lot of restrictions on being able to do things as an administrator in your environment, hopefully you can at least run VirtualBox and just run it as a VM, right? And we found that that's a good way for a lot of people to get started. Um, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that anyone has. Thank you.
All right, well, I'll be around. <laughs> Thank you.